all right so today we will begin our discussion of linear second order ordinary differential equations okay so again linear has the same meaning as before it is linear in y and all its derivatives okay so a general second order linear ordinary differential equation takes the form y double prime plus some p of x y prime plus some q of x y equals some r of x so this is the general form of a second order ordinary differential equation that is linear so suppose if i have something like you know a, a y cubed or a y square or a y prime y double prime or terms like these then this uh, equation is not linear. Now, even if it doesn't look uh, non-linear, if I can somehow bring it to a linear form, it is still called a linear second order ODE. But if I'm absolutely not able to bring it into this form, it is certainly a non-linear differential equation, okay? So for example, something like y double prime plus y square equal to zero would be a non-linear differential equation. Okay. So this is actually called an inhomogeneous equation or a non-homogeneous equation. This is the inhomogeneous term. Okay. So what is a homogeneous differential equation? A homogeneous linear second order ODE has the exact same form, but with R of X equal to zero, the right-hand side would be equal to zero. So this homogeneous equation, I can write as Y double prime plus P of X Y prime plus Q of X Y equals zero. We will start with equations of this form, and then we will slowly move over to equations of the previous form. Uh, admittedly, the second form is certainly easier to handle because the right-hand side is equal to zero, but not just that, there are many, um, practical examples of uh, homogeneous uh, linear second order differential equations. And they have certain nice properties that we will understand today, okay? All right. So homogeneous means this particular form. So immediately you recognize that, for example, I can write this whole equation as d square dx square plus p of x d dx plus q of x, the whole thing acting on y of x equals zero, right? So it has the simple form, something acting on y equals zero. So immediately recognize that I can multiply y by some constant and that will also be a solution, okay? So if y of x is a solution, then c times y of x is also a solution. And if this seems like a trivial point, note that this is not true for the general equation written here. If I multiply y by c, then the left hand side is multiplied by c, the right hand side is not multiplied by c. So that equation, if y is a solution, then c times y is uh, actually not a solution. So you cannot uh, make that claim for this equation, but for the homogeneous part, you can certainly make that claim. So this is certainly one interesting aspect, admittedly the less interesting aspect of homogeneous differential equation. So uh, the couple of important aspects of this are best uh, illustrated using some kind of an example. And I will choose a relatively simple example that hopefully you have seen in your uh, physics class last semester. If you have not seen it, uh, please view this as simply a mathematical equation that is rather straightforward. So I hope you remember that uh, all of you did what is called particle in the box problem last semester. Um, is this familiar to everybody or should I not use these words? Yes or no? Did you guys do this example in quantum mechanics in PH101? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, we did. Okay. So basically what you do is you solve the Schrodinger equation, which is a second order time independent Schrodinger equation, which is a second order ordinary differential equation. And then you put some poor particle, an electron or whatever it is in a box. Basically what I mean is that there's infinite force on this side, there's infinite force on that side. So the particle really cannot escape this narrow uh, region. 
So let us call this x is equal to zero and x is equal to L or something like that. And then you put this poor particle somewhere here and you want to solve the Schrodinger equation, right? So what is the time independent Schrodinger equation? Minus h bar square over two M d square dx square acting on the wave function psi of x plus the potential acting on the wave function equals the energy times psi, right? So this is the time independent Schrodinger equation. And for this particular case, of course, the particle inside the box is in a force free region where the potential is equal to zero. Well, the potential could be a constant. I can always rescale it to zero. So in this case, this is a homogeneous second order differential equation that is markedly simpler. So in this case, I'll have minus h bar square d square psi dx square equals e psi, which I can rewrite as psi double prime equals minus k square psi, where, or rather, I will put it in this particular form, <clears throat> which I can write as psi double prime plus k square psi equals zero, where k square is some quantity to me over h bar square. It is a constant, and you can, in principle, determine this constant. Okay, we will not go into the quantization and things like that, but viewing this as a second order homogeneous differential equation, notice that this is even simpler than this particular form because there is no first derivative involved. There is only one second derivative and psi itself. Psi plays the role of y of x, basically. I can write the most general solution for this example as, which you guys wrote uh, last semester as a sine kx plus b cosine kx, okay? So this is the first property that I want to uh, talk about a little bit. Why do I write it in term? Why do I write it as a sine kx plus b cosine kx? It's very easy to verify that sine and cosine are solutions for this differential equation, right? So if I plug in uh, psi equals sine kx, so psi double prime equals k squared psi. If I plug in psi as sine kx, what do I get? Psi prime would be k, cosine kx and psi double prime is minus k square sine kx, which is precisely minus k square psi, which is this differential equation. And exactly like that, you can also prove that uh, psi of x equals cosine kx is also a solution of this differential equation, okay? And then your physics teacher went ahead and said that, uh, look, you need to figure out a and b. Uh, there is a bunch of things in, uh, available to you to solve this, you can use what is called the boundary conditions, right? So boundary conditions, it's exactly like an initial value problem, right? And except that instead of time, which is um, y at some instant of time initial value, I'm saying that uh, psi at some particular uh, value of x is known. And in this case, you're told that psi at x is equal to zero is zero simply because there is an infinite force and the particle cannot escape. So which means since the wave function has to be continuous across the wall, if it, if it has to be zero here, it has to be zero on the boundary also, right? So this fixes basically that B has to be equal to zero because sine kx is automatically zero at x is equal to zero. So if I demand that <clears throat> psi vanishes at x is equal to zero, I should plug in explicitly that b equal to zero. So this is an example of an initial value problem, right? And then you uh, formally, the way you set up the initial value problem in, in, in second order differential equations is to also demand that the second uh, first derivative is also known at some particular instant of time. But in the case of quantum mechanics, of course, you uh, set this by claiming that uh, the wave function is normalized, okay? Be that as it may, so uh, I, wanted to give you run through this quick example because you have already seen and enjoyed and uh, done a lot of these examples in your previous classes. We'll be talking about some of the properties of the solutions that you have already seen, okay? First solution that you have seen, uh, the first uh, uh, aspect of these solutions that you have already seen is actually quite important. It, it's actually central in quantum mechanics and gives rise to all these weird phenomena in quantum mechanics, as you probably know. And this is called the superposition principle. Oh, 
what is the super precision principle? Well, <clears throat> if you look at this solution, psi of x equals a sine kx plus b cosine kx, I can individually verify that sine and cosine are solutions, no problem. But it also happens that if sine and cosine are solutions, a linear combination of, combination of them is also a solution. Now that is, of course, not immediately apparent, uh, but you can always plug this differential, uh, plug this solution back into this differential equation and check that a sine kx plus b cosine kx is actually a solution. It is not as uh, straightforward to see with the naked eye as, for example, just sine kx and cosine kx. Nevertheless, it is true. So it turns out that for a homogeneous, for a homogeneous second order ODE, if y1 of x and y2 of x are solutions, then so is the general linear combination y of x equals c1 y1x plus c2 y2x. It hardly matters what c1 and c2 are. They could even be complex for all I care. Okay. Any general linear combination of these two solutions is also a solution. Okay. In many of these examples, we will take them to be real because we are dealing with the real plane. Uh, but in the case of quantum mechanics, for example, there is no restriction that A and B should be real, right? They can also be complex as you probably know. So this is a first general uh, idea about homogeneous differential equations. Notice that the word homogeneous is very important here. This is certainly not true for an inhomogeneous equation of this kind. Okay. For this particular equation, if I have y1 and y2 as solution, I cannot just add them up and claim that y1, uh, c1 y1 plus c2 y2 is also a solution. Okay. So we'll actually show this explicitly. So let us say y1 and y2 are solutions, right? So what does this mean? Let us, let me write the general equation as y double prime plus p of x y prime plus q of x y equals zero. Now I know that y1 and y2 are solution, which means y1 and y2, remember our definition of solution. When I say something is a solution, if I plug it back in the differential equation, I get an identity, okay? So if, if I substitute y equals y1, of course I have y1 double prime plus p of x y1 prime plus q of x y1 equals zero and the same for y2. This is what I mean when I say that y1 and y2 are solutions of this differential equation. So now let us check if the general linear combination is also a solution. So y of x equals c1 y1 plus c2 y2. What is y double prime? y double prime would be c1 y1 double prime plus c2 y2 double prime. And y prime would obviously be c1 y1 prime plus c2 y2 prime, okay? So now let us plug everything in the differential equation and calculate y double prime plus p of x y prime plus q of x y. This would be equal to the first term is c1 y1 double prime plus c2 y2 double prime. The second term is p of x times c1 y1 prime plus c2 y2 prime. I'm sure you see where I'm going with this. And the last term is q of x is c1 y1 plus c2 y2, okay? And since y1 is a solution, everything which I am marking uh, under as uh, green adds up to zero, right? Because y1 is a solution, I can factor out c1 from these three terms and write this as c1 times y1 double prime plus p of x y1 prime plus q of x y1, which turns out to be equal to zero because y1 is a solution. Similarly, everything that is over the red line also adds up to zero, which means the entire thing adds up to zero. So if y1 and y2 are solutions, so is a general linear combination of them. The superposition principle holds, okay?
And this makes your life very, very, very easy. Okay. Uh, sir, uh, yes. could you please repeat this last line? I didn't get that. Huh, so, sure. so you got till the substituting y equals c1 y1 plus c2 y2? Uh, yeah. Okay. So then I will rearrange this equation. So I will take off this equal to zero and I will rearrange this equation. I'll take c1 common and I will write this as y1 double prime plus p of x y1 plus q of x y1 plus c2 y2 double prime plus q of x y2. Agree? Uh, yeah. So y1 and y2 are solutions, which means mm -hmm. y1 satisfies this differential equation and y2 satisfies this differential equation, right? That is what okay. I mean uh, when I say y1 and y2 are solutions. So this guy has to be equal to zero because y1 is a solution and it satisfies the differential equation. And this guy also has to be zero. Yes. Okay. Agree? Yeah. So this has to be equal to zero. So if y1 and y2 are solutions, a linear combination of them is also a solution. Okay. By the way, you you, you guys use this fact extensively when you solved uh, in both electromagnetism and quantum mechanics. Now, forgive me for going back to physics. Uh, uh, I have a slight bias, obviously, but uh, you guys use this extensively, right? So even in this particle box, particle in a box problem, um, uh, for example. Uh, you, once you guess that sine kx is a solution, of course, cosine kx is very easy to see. You can easily guess that cosine kx is also a solution from the knowledge of what is called the basis, which I will come to in just a second. Okay, but not just that. Um, for example, when you solve the Laplace equation, right? Laplace equation. Again, it is very very wrong of a teacher to give an example of a partial differential equation when he is talking about ordinary differential equation, but since you have already seen these things, let me take advantage of that fact, right? So you solve this equation, del square phi equals zero, right? And then you said that, uh, wait, this is all very complicated. This is d square phi dx square plus d square phi dy square plus d square phi dc square equals zero. So instead of, you know, working all of these things, let me actually uh, use the very simple uh, solution that phi is separable in this particular form, okay? Now, if somebody just told you this, you should be shocked because there is no guarantee that this is the most general solution of the equation that I've written above, right? But you use the fact that you're dealing with a homogeneous differential equation. So basically what you said was, look, yes, I am only finding some specific classes of solutions and I'm not pretending that this is a general solution, but in MA201, I'm going to learn that this is a homogeneous second order differential equation, which means that any linear combination of solutions is also a solution. So I can always write down my general solution phi, I'll call these some phi n, and I will write this as some linear combination of these phi, phi n's. Okay, and this is my general solution. And this, of course, to get this straight away from this differential equation might be a little hard. So I will exploit the linearity of the differential equation figure out some solution and then take linear combinations of these solutions. So you use this fact extensively in quantum mechanics and electromagnetism, okay? So uh, any, any questions or comments about any of this? Is this all okay? Okay. So it might be a good idea for you to sort of go back and if not uh, study, at least like look through your notes of 101 where you solve these differential equations and sort of, you know, um, so familiarize yourself with them again in case you've forgotten. It might be useful in this course also. Okay. So how do I, <laughs> of course, um, here I have not, up till now, I've not told you how to get the solutions that we will do in steps, uh, in small steps, of course. Here, I'm only talking about certain general properties of these, uh, of these equations, okay? So how do I formulate a general initial value problem? A general initial value problem, okay? The way I would formulate it is exactly the same way I formulated in the case of first order differential equations with one particular addition. So suppose if I'm trying to solve this equation, 
okay my initial value problem would be formulated such that i give you the value of y at some initial uh, value of x x zero okay let this be some uh, uh, k zero but this is not sufficient because this is a second order differential equation so suppose if you uh, simply imagine integrating this equation you have to integrate it twice right to get the solution so when you integrate it once you will get one integration constant when you integrate it again you will get the second one so you need to determine two integration constants in this particular equation so i need to supplement this with not just one but two initial conditions and the second one is chosen to be the value of the derivative at the initial point and let me call this some m0 or whatever it is okay again this is something you have seen for example right from your sixth standard right so when your high school teacher first gave you what newton's law is right opened you up to a whole new world she told you that newton's law can be written in one dimension at least as f is m d square x over d t square this is again a second order differential equation if i'm dealing with a constant force it's even simpler if i'm not dealing with a constant force if i'm uh, dealing with a force that depends on where it is in, in position, then it's slightly more difficult to solve, but it can still be solved. It's still a linear second order differential equation. Okay. And to find the complete solution of this, what is the solution? Solution is basically X as a function of T, right? You are required to find the trajectory of the particle and your textbook problems usually tell you that the initial position of the particle X at time T equal to zero is some X zero and the initial velocity of the particle x prime at time t equal to zero is some v zero right with these two initial conditions we can go ahead and solve the classical mechanics problem of finding the trajectory of the particle this is what you guys did for a uh, good part of your lives in, in high school basically in, in in many different forms so as such these things are probably not new to you but we will go through examples that uh, you might not have seen before okay so any questions or comments up till now so this is how you set up the basic uh, initial value problem okay so the first important concept is um, the superposition principle once you have one solution and two solutions you can construct a linear combination of the two solutions and that is also a solution the second important concept is the concept of basis. This is very important and uh, has a lot of beautiful applications, uh, including in your electromagnetism or quantum mechanics or any other engineering problem, uh, wave mechanics, study of wave motions, uh, whatever it is that you're talking about. Basis is a very, very important concept. And you guys have already seen what a basis is back in your, uh, I don't know, uh, middle school, right? When you first uh, learned the notion of vectors. So back in your middle school, when you first understood what vectors are, somebody told you that vectors are directed line segments in space or something like that, right? Which is not a very good definition of vectors are, but it is okay uh, as a first understanding of vectors. So you understood vectors, example, vectors as A equals, if you're dealing with just uh, two dimensions, it is some a i cap plus some b j cap right and then when you became big boys and girls and looked at three dimensions you also said c times k cap okay so how do you deconstruct this equation so this is a line segment whose x component is a whose y component is b and whose z component is c okay and then i write it in this very bizarre notation so what does this mean this means that this vector extends in the x, y, z directions and the length of the vector in some sense. Uh, that is what a component means along the x direction is a and so on and so forth. So it turns out that the most important thing in this definition is, uh, is that you are actually able to decompose the vector in this particular fashion. In other words, there are three uh, harmless looking but extremely important vectors called unit vectors, right? unit vectors. These unit vectors in this case are i, j, and k. 
and even though you hardly realize it and take it for granted they play a very very important role they they tell you that no matter what vector you're talking about in this three dimensional space you can express that vector as a linear combination of as any vector in the x y z plane can be written as a times i plus b times j plus c times k now this is extremely profound but it's hard to um, understand how profound it is because everybody is so used to it and this actually defines for the first time in your life the concept of a basis notion a basis set is a very fundamental set with which all other objects can be expressed any object can be understood as a linear combination of the basis objects in the case of vectors these basis objects are the unit vectors i j and k so with some basis fundamental objects i can express any vector in this in the same uh, x y z i cannot go to x y z and one more m plane and then say that i j k is sufficient it is not obviously i need to tag on one more unit vector in that case but if i'm talking about a three dimensional space i have three fundamental objects i j and k and i can express every other object in this space in this space is a linear combination of these three fundamental objects okay and here's the fun part it is not restricted to the notion of vectors okay you can apply it to matrices for example every traceless 2 by 2 matrix uh, can be written as a linear combination of what are called pauli matrices okay um you can apply it to functions which uh, should interest you in the present context because you have all seen what is called a fourier series right so what is a fourier series you took some arbitrary function f of x and you wrote that as, as a linear combination of sines and cosines right so that should have given you pause you should have said uh, what the heck are we doing right you are taking some function and you are writing it as a linear combination of sine and cos sine and cos are wavy functions right so sometimes you actually write x as a linear combination of sine and cos so what is it that you're doing there so basically what are what you're doing is you're living in what is called a function space in which case the basis functions are sine and cos these very simple two trigonometric functions are actually very profoundly important in the concept of function space it turns out that just like i and j in a two dimensional vector space sine and cos are actually a basis set you can write down every function as a linear combination of sine and cos with some restrictions uh, with some uh, understanding of what space you are in i don't want to go into those questions but remember that the sine and cos play the exact same role in in this complicated space called function space as i and j play in your uh, in your xyz space okay the other thing is notice that there is nothing sacred about these unit vectors right so let us say i live in a two dimensional space excuse me this thing grew bigger so let's say i live in i live in a two dimensional space and i'm saying that i and j are my unit vectors right and you can come along and say i, I don't really like i and j um i want e1 and e2 and i say what are e1 and e2 and you say oh, well e1 is uh, 1 over root 2 times i plus j and e2 is 1 over root 2 times i minus j okay and you claim that i you want to work with these two basis vectors so um should i say yes or no the answer is i should say yes because there is nothing that says that one set of basis vectors is more fundamental than the other set so in the case of vectors of course this means what what defines a basis set means that you want these guys to be properly normalized and properly orthogonal to each other and you can show that these guys are also properly normalized and properly orthogonal so this is normalization this is orthogonal so there is also nothing sacred about basis vectors you can transform one basis set into another basis set so the same thing is true for functions even though i will not go into that right now okay so what is a basis set a basis set is basically a set of fundamental objects with which you can express every other object in that particular space you are living in okay now you cannot make absurd claims that i should be able to uh, describe every traceless 2 by 2 matrix as a linear combination of i j and k that is not what i'm saying 
you should first define the space in which you're operating. If, you, if the space in which you're operating is three-dimensional vectors, then I, J, K is a proper matrix. If the space in which you're operating is a set of two by two matrices, then the three Pauli matrices are a good basis. If you don't know what Pauli matrices are, don't worry about it. Yes, there is a question. Please tell me or uh, or uh, type it in. Sir, 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 like you observed here, I cross the uh, I dot I is one and uh, I dot J is zero. Sir, is it is this supposed to be a property of every basis vector in the X Y plane of so, every two basic basis vectors? Huh, so in most in, uh, basic cases of practical interest, this is what is will happen. In fact, this this. The same notion of orthogonality uh, will also apply to what are called function spaces, right? So if I say sine and cosine are, are uh, uh, basis functions, then sine and cosine should also follow certain rules like these, right? Now it's hard to see what these rules are because i dot i equal to one is very easy to see. i dot j equal to zero is something easy to see, but this is something that um, all basis vectors should follow. In the case of sine and cosine, in the case of function spaces, the rules are a little more complicated, right? So what you do is, in this case, you just multiply the two basis vectors. In the case of sine, for example, you multiply the two, but that doesn't define the operation of dot product, right? So you actually have to integrate over some uh, interval. And if you integrate sine times cosine over a complete cycle, you will get zero. And if you get, uh, if you properly normalize this, if you integrate sine times sine, you will get one and cosine times cosine, you will get one. So the rules for constructing these dot products can be different, can be more complicated in certain spaces, but such rules always exist as long as you're talking about basis vectors. Does it answer your question? Yes. Oh. So this depends the notion of basis. Now, why I'm talking too much about basis sets? It turns out that, you know, uh, these second order homogeneous differential equations, the solutions y1 and y2 actually form a basis. Okay, even though we will not talk in detail about function spaces, uh, this is very important to understand. And this fact has to do with uh, the fact that we are dealing with what is called a Hermitian operator. But since we are not going to talk about operators, uh, let us not go into that too much. So y1 and y2 solutions of, uh, the, the, there are two basic solutions of, uh, first order, second order differential equation. So second order ODE, you have two solutions, Y1 and Y2, okay? And then we also found out that C equals C1 Y1 plus C2 Y2 is also a solution, okay? Now you might wonder, look, I also told you that if y1 is a solution, then 8y1 is also a solution, as long as we're dealing with homogeneous differential equations. So in this y1 and y2, can I take y1 and 8 times y2? The answer is no. If you want a proper basis, you have to make sure that the two uh, functions are not trivially related to each other, okay? And by trivially related, I mean an uh, important mathematical concept called linear independence. What is linear independence? So y1 and uh, 7.5 times y1, if y1 is a solution of a homogeneous differential equation, and then 7.5 times y1 is also a solution, are both solutions of some, I don't know what, some second order, homogeneous ODE, but they are not linearly independent. In the next week, I will introduce the concept of Ronskian and we will revisit this concept of linear independence uh, for multiple solutions, even the third order, fourth order, whatever it is, it's an easy way to check if the given solutions are linearly independent or not. But if you only have two solutions, it's quite easy to check if two solutions are linearly independent or not. What do I mean by that? So suppose if somebody gives you Y1 and Y2 and says that, look, these are the solutions of a, some second order differential equation. And I tell you that these are linearly independent. Now, you should not believe that person. You should first check if they are linearly independent or not. The way you check it is as follows. If 
the equation c1 y1 plus c2 y2 equal to 0 has non-trivial solutions, then maybe I should rephrase it. Let me rephrase it. If the only solution of the equation C1 Y1 plus C2 Y2 equal to zero is C1 equal to zero and C2 equal to zero, then Y1 and Y2 are linearly independent. In other words, if, if on the other hand, I can write y2 as uh, minus c1 over c2 times y1, then y1 and y2 are not linearly independent. In other words, they're linearly dependent. The ratio of y1 and y2 is a constant, okay? If a quotient like that exists, then the two solutions are not linearly independent. Again, this, uh, this statement applies whether you're talking about functions of x or um, uh, vectors or whatever it is, right? So for example, uh, this might be easier for you to see than functions. Example in vectors, take two vectors in the one dimension in the, in the x, y plane, right? So I can write i as the column vector one, zero and j as the column vector zero, one. And try to write the vector one, zero as a linear combination of the vector zero, one. There is no way you can do that, okay? But I can write the vector one, one as I plus J, which is one, zero plus zero, one, right? Because then I can claim that the vector one, one is a linear combination of I and J. It is not really linearly independent. But there is no way I can write i as a function of j. I cannot write i equal to 5 times j, right? There is no way because these are completely different objects. And neither can I write j as a function of i. So in the case of vectors, this is an easy, easy way to see if they are linearly independent or not. Same case with functions. If you have two functions, y2 and y1, and if you take, so the easiest way to see it is uh, take the uh, ratio of the two functions. If it is simply a constant, then you are not dealing with linearly independent solutions. But if the ratio of the two functions is also some complicated function of x or even a simple function of x, then they are indeed linearly independent. So when I claim that uh, the general solution is c1 y1 plus c2 y2, all I'm, uh, I'm actually claiming that it is the, uh, the general linear combination of linearly independent solutions. And a set of linearly independent solutions, a set of linearly independent solutions forms a basis. So in this case, y1 and y2 form a basis, okay? So sine kx and cosine kx form a basis, sine x and cosine x form a basis, okay? So uh, I can equivalently uh, formulate uh, this problem as, you know, given a second order differential equation, what is the basis? And basically all I'm asking is figure out the solutions of this differential equation. Okay. All right. So the last thing that we will do today is a very uh, nice concept that exists for homogeneous differential equations. And this concept is called reduction of basis. Basically, it is a phrase that uh, answers the following questions. Look, suppose if you are given some differential equation and you're able to guess one solution, okay, by some, by some hook or crook or somebody told you what one solution is, then using uh, 
the concept of linear independence that the ratio of these two solutions is actually some function of x and not just a constant you can actually figure out the other solutions other solution okay what does this mean so let us actually do it for a uh, simple example from your textbook and then i will talk about the general theory of this tomorrow and then we will move on to constant coefficients tomorrow so this is best illustrated by an example first the example that i will take is x square minus x y double prime minus x y prime plus y equal to zero now this whole thing can arise only if you can guess one solution or somebody tells you one solution if not of course you'll have to solve this differential equation first notice that this is a linear second order differential equation i can divide throughout by x times x minus one and it's of the form y double prime plus p of x y prime plus q of x y equals zero. okay and then you can actually check that y of x equals x is a solution okay before uh, moving forward let us actually check that this is true if y of x equals x so let me call this y1 this is the first solution so what is y1 prime y1 prime is one and of course y1 double prime is zero so if I plug this in this differential equation, what do I get? The first term is zero because y1 double prime is zero. The second term is minus x times y1 prime is one plus y1, which is x. And obviously this is equal to zero. So by simple check, uh, since I already told you, you know that y1 equal to x is a solution of this differential equation. So the question is, what is the second solution? So there is actually a systematic way from using which you can extract the second solution uh, given the first solution. So what is this procedure? So first notice that I want, I don't want uh, the second solution to be uh, 5x, right? That is uh, not a linearly independent solution. So I'm looking for a second solution y2, which is some function times y1, okay? So it's some non-trivial function. I don't know what this function is. So, so if I can solve for u, I basically know y2 because I already know y1. Okay. So I, I basically assume that y2 can be written in this particular fashion, which is reasonable. So it is very important that u is a function of x and not just a constant. A constant would mean that these two solutions are not linearly independent. Okay. So now the uh, problem of finding y1, sorry, y2 boils down to finding u. So let us plug this uh, on sorts into the parent differential equation. So what is y2 prime? y2 prime would be u1 prime y1 plus um, q1 y1 prime. Since y1 is x, this means this is equal to u prime x plus u. So far, so good. Any questions about this? Any questions or any comments? So y2 double prime would be differentiate this guy. So the first term would be I differentiate a u prime keeping x constant. So that will be u double prime x. And then I differentiate x keeping u prime constant. That is just u prime. And the third term is just u prime. So this will be u double prime x plus 2u prime. Okay. So let me plug this back in the differential equation. So x square minus x, y2 double prime, y2 double prime is u double prime x plus 2u prime minus x, y, y2 prime is u prime x plus u from here, from this equation, plus y2, which is u times y1 equals 0. Are there any questions about this equation? I know that y1 equals x is a solution. I'm trying to find the second solution. Since I'm looking for a linearly independent solution, I'm looking for y2, which is some function of x times y1. I can always write it this way, right? Uh, as long as I'm dealing with perfectly valid functions, I can always write any arbitrary function as u of x times x. If it turns out that it doesn't have the x, then u of x will have uh, 1 over x there. That's all. Then I figure out y2 prime and y2 double prime and substitute everything in the parent differential equation and turn this into a differential equation for u instead of y2. 
and now you ask what's the big deal because you had one unknown uh, second order differential equation now we have another unknown second order differential equation right sorry the last term is uh, y2 which is u times x not u times y because y2 is u times x so let's clean this up and i will show you that this is actually not the case this is actually a much simpler equation than the parent differential equation otherwise there is no point doing this so the second order term is x times x square minus x times u double prime and if i collect all the u prime terms i have from the first term i have 2 times x square minus x and from the second term i have minus x square right and the plus ux term and the minus ux term cancel so i don't have a term in u and this is important this is what makes this equation simpler than the first equation so now i can clean this up even further x square minus x u double prime plus what is this 2 x square minus x square is x square so this is x square minus 2x u prime equals 0 okay now i will divide through by um, x so i have x times x minus 1 u double prime plus x minus 2 u prime equal to 0